What's up, guys? It's Adi again, Gate 7 International. We've had plenty of pre-match content for you leading up to the big game. And I am joined here by a very, very special guest. We have Nima Tavali from the Italian Football Podcast. Nima, how are you doing today? I'm good. It's good to be with you. I hope you're all doing well. Um, and I bet you're all excited for for tomorrow. It's, it's a big day in Greek football. Yes, at the time of recording, we are looking forward to tomorrow, the match tomorrow here. So, guys, before we jump into the rest of the content that we have for this show, don't forget to like and subscribe. We are growing this red and white community every day. We find new people literally every day. It's a red and white movement that we hope caps off with a huge victory tomorrow. We're going to get into all of that, and we're going to get into uh, our opponent in just a moment. You can also support us on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash gate7international. Uh, tiers starting at a dollar a month. Thank you to all of our patrons for your support. Now, Nima, before we get started with the analysis or the discussion about Fiorentina itself, Give us a little bit about your background uh, with uh, not just Italian football, but you also uh, do things with Sempre Inter. You're a co-founder of Sempre Inter. We see you posting about Inter all the time. So give us a little bit about your background in relation to Italian football and Inter. Well, um, I started Sempre Inter in February 2012 um, and with the express goal of it becoming the biggest news site in English about Inter, about Inter Milan for Inter Milan fans, because of, of course, when I was growing up in Sweden, um, I, my, you know, I came to Sweden as a three-year-old with my mother and grandmother as a refugee from Iran. And, and of course, growing up, I fell in love. The first game I watched today, actually, when we're recording this is exactly 34 day, 34 years since the day I became an Interista. And the reason I know it's 34 years is because it was on this day that Inter dei Record, Giovanni Trappatoni's Inter dei Record of 88-89, beat Maradona's Napoli 2-1 at the San Siro to secure the Scudetto for the number 13, which was the first game I saw of Inter uh, on TV, and I fell in love. Um, and since then, I was I was hooked. Um, but of course, growing up after that, there was nothing there. If you didn't speak Italian, which I didn't, because as I said, my background is Iranian. So I decided that, you know, when the internet came and social media, I decided that I wanted to create something that, you know, for Inter fans like myself to have a community and be able to be connected to Inter without, you know, um, you know, the, the, to have what I did not have growing up, essentially. And that's kind of how it all started. And it's been a very, very wild and exciting journey since. It's been very good. We, you know, I've done lots of work for Gianluca Di Marzio, Gold.com, did exclusives for them, for Football Italia, uh, exclusive interviews, ex exclusive transfer news, exclusive news. And, of course, three years ago, I started the Italian football podcast with Carlo Garganese, uh, who was the head of content at Gold.com about way, way back. Um, and uh, we we wanted to do cover Italian football with the podcast the way we like doing it, uh, and we we're very happy because we have a you know we've been able to interview some really really fantastic people. We've had everyone from you know Sven Goran Eriksson to Roy Hodgson to you know American owners Joe Tacopina and Matt Rizzetta. Uh, on very quite a few times um, and and many other people and and so yeah we're we're very excited very happy and proud of the community that we've built and 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 uh, yeah that's basically what I've done for twelve years with with Italian football. That is incredible. Uh, and and mm -hmm. I, you could tell I timed your anniversary to the day. Just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's it literally is thirty four wow. days to the day uh 28th of may uh, 1989 when lothar mateo scored that winner and and that meant that inter became uh, champions of uh, italy for number 13 and in the in the record breaking fashion against the reigning champions of napoli against maradona's napoli when seria literally ruled the world and 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 it was at san siro and uh, it was unbelievable and and it's funny because the last time, if I'm not mistaken, that Inter won the Scudetto at the San Siro, secured the Scudetto at the San Siro. Wow. Well, it was 34 years between them. This year, obviously, they did it against Milan, but they, uh, they Milan were the home team. So the last time Inter were officially the home team and won, secured the Scudetto on the pitch was 
1989, 34 years ago today. Yeah. That's crazy. Mm. Wow. That's a that's an amazing story. I love that. You, you quite literally you are exactly what we what kind of like we are doing with Libyakos, the the way you explain kind of why you started Sempre Inter and and why mm. you're doing the Italian football podcast. It's literally like the very similar motivations to us. That's uh incredible, incredible story. I love it. Thank you. Now, uh now Nima, you have a lot of experience, <laughs> 34 years of experience watching Serie A, uh, seeing how the landscape has changed, seeing how teams have come and gone. So my first question for you with regard to our upcoming opponents opponents in the Conference League final, Fiorentina, uh, what is your perspective on Fiorentina status as a club? And, and, and then based on that status, how you've seen them throughout your life, how have things kind of changed, in your opinion, under Vincenzo Italiano, their current coach? Well, I mean, it's rather interesting because a couple of years ago when they sold Vlaovic and Federico Chiesa, of course, Rocco Comiso, the American owner, the first thing he said when he took over Fiorentina, even though himself he himself was a Juventino growing up, he said, "I don't want another Baggio to Juve. I'm not going to sell. I'm not going to sell Chiesa to Juve." And he ended up selling both his biggest stars to Juve, Vlaovic and Chiesa. Uh, so, you know, but, and that's fine because he got lots of money for them both. But the problem is that, well, you know, how did he spend them, spend it? And Pradier, the sporting director, who I don't think is very good, which is quite rare in Italian football, as most sporting directors are really good. Um, he spent it rather unwisely. And, you know, they brought in Vincenzo Italiano from Spezia. He was a young coach. He, he performed a miracle with Spezia. Um, bring them up to Serie A and obviously keeping them in the Serie A. We're good with, very good with young players. Um, but I would say that it's been rather disappointing um, these last two years in the league. I, I think they've been under underperformed. I think they should have been higher up. I think the amount of money they've spent and, and the amount of money, well, you can, you know, you can, obviously you can make the argument that it was not well spent by the sporting director, but regardless, they should be higher up than when they are, where they've been for the last, two years, uh, three years. Um, and so, but aside from that, in two, you know, two years where he's been in three finals, Coppa Italia, Conference League last year, and of course, Conference League this year, you know, that on paper sounds rather good. But if you actually look at it, um, the Conference League, if you look at all the teams they played on the route to these two finals, they were all teams they should have beaten. So they've not overperformed by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, the overperforming, should have come against West Ham last year, but instead they kind of blew it. Now, after Olympiacos um, and El Cabi, uh, El Caba or El Cabi? I always forget how to pronounce El it. El Cabi, yeah. El Cabi. I mean, after he scored those, that, that just went crazy against Aston Villa. Yeah. Um, that that now feels like an opportunity. It would be a huge flop if 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 Italiano ends his tenure because he will leave Fiorentina at the end of the season with zero titles. Um, because he will, he won't have overachieved. Now, Fiorentina obviously is a side that historically, with Batistuta, Rui Costa, you know, all these players was was very you know back when Calcio ruled the world was was a big side in the Champions League and, and so on and so forth. But of course, they um, you know they've fallen off. I mean, they're not a provincial side, but they're also not one of the biggest sides. Uh, they're, you could say that they're they're you know. The, um, the, city sizes and size with Bologna, but it's a proud club. It's a classic Italian football club. And they need this trophy because Rocco Comiso, of course, the owner has built a fantastic new training facilities. Uh, he's trying to build a new stadium. He's been, you know, he's, he's not very diplomatic. Uh, and Florence is a very proud city. It's, it's the city from which Europe and the world, some would say, was was ruled uh, in the Renaissance and even after that with the Medici, the Medici banker family basically controlling most of, the, you know, the world in Europe. Um, and so they are very proud. And, and Rocco waltzes in there and talks to them basically not very diplomatically. And, of course, he's, he's, he's had troubles. But, of course, now they seem to find each other more on a... On a, on a better, you know, they seem to have understood each other and they, they seem to working towards something to a, to a solution which is good for everybody. And, and by everybody, I mean a new stadium for Fiorentina, which is what they need. 
Um, but also, of course, the sad, tragic passing of Joe Barone, who passed away unexpectedly, un unexpectedly not too long ago. Um, you know, if Fiorentina win that, it will be very emotional for them because obviously they're a club who, in recent years, with Astori and the player who died, you know, just on match day, and um, and and uh, Barone, you know, they they've they've suffered loss, and so it would be it would be uh, a way for them to kind of, you know, honor their 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 heroes who are no longer with us. Um, so no, Fiorentina have been have ever ever since the semi final when they made you know when they won and and reached the final they've been talking about this game because they they this is a club that hasn't won in a european trophy since the 60s um they haven't won any any trophies pretty much in 20 30 years they need a trophy the city i've lived in florence um i know what kind of city it is i've got family there it's a it's it's a very heated fan base it's a very proud fan base they need a trophy to kind of build upon and move forward um so it's you know they are they are very charged up and fired up um going into this game absolutely now you brought up some very interesting points early on about fiorentina how they spent the money that uh they received when they sold vlahovic and um and chiesa now you also talked about how you think they're underperforming uh relative to how they should be in Serie A things that which we've discussed and uh, we actually did a little power ranking on Fiorentina showing how actually how solid their defense was in various aspects like least shots allowed according to Y scout that is uh, highest pressing intensity uh, you know like top five in terms of certain areas of goals scored goals allowed all of all of those things and my my question for you is and I think you kind of alluded to it already um, what is what do you think specifically is keeping Fiorentina from these Champions League spots? I mean, you brought up the budget, so is it depth that's the problem mm. with them? What is it? I think it's a it's a it's a combination of many things. I think it's a combination of poorly spent on on players that aren't good enough, um, but also Vincenzo Italiano, who I think is. And it is more it, his strength lay in the final third of the pitch and the attacking third, mm -hmm. in order to get the ball to the goal. Um, his defending is very naive at times. He's the man, man marking, the high press, the not not so cohesive press. I mean, in in, in Serie A they get carved open many many times, very easily. Um, so they're not very defensively solid, um, but he does play a kind of football that pays off more in Europe. I do believe that, and I think we've seen that in the last few years. So, you know, I, I think a bit of what they say in Italy, cinismo, a bit of more cynicism is, is what they need, what, what I think Fiorentina need. And it doesn't seem that Comiso agrees with that because he's close to bringing in Raffaele Palladino, who has been at Monza for two years and done a decent job there, but he's not exactly been known for his fantastic defensive uh, abilities either. So I think it's going to be a little bit more of the same, you know, bring a young Italian coach in who plays attacking football and and try and give him the space to grow, um, which is fair enough. I mean, if you look at where they are in the pecking order, um, you know, we're right now behind Inter, Milan, Napoli, Juve, uh, Roma, and, and, and Lazio as well, um, and Atalanta, who just won the Europa League. I mean, they should be ahead of Atalanta, but Atalanta are so bloody well run. Um, Fiorentina want to be that as well, but they, that's why this trophy even becomes more important, because if they win it, they will be guaranteed a place in the Europa League next season, which is very important for them. Absolutely. And we know uh, it's kind of, in a way, of equal importance to Olympiacos. Olympiacos is uh, celebrating its 100th year of existence next year and fortunately although our our season has been a little bit of a disappointment this year for various reasons um not including of course this magical european run but it, the roller coaster we've had three coaches uh jose luis mendilibar just showed up basically in february uh one of his first games he took over actually his first game he took over was our round of 32 game against ferenc varos in the knockout to the conference league 
So well, that's so, what Mendilibar does, isn't it? I mean, he did yeah. the same thing with Sevilla last year. Yes, he, he came did. into the first game, I think it was in the Europa League, and he ended up winning that against Roma on penalties. <laughs> so, you know, he you have a coach there that, that is experienced. He knows what to do against Italian teams, which I guess from yep. an Italian perspective, I'm a little bit worried about. Um, right. Yeah. So my, my question then, if, since you kind of already started to bring up a little bit about philosophy with Vigento Italiano, my, my question to you is, it's see, does Vicenzo Italiano approach these European games the same way he does the games in Serie A? Yes, there's he has one gear and that is forward. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, the, the difference is that teams in Europe aren't, as, especially in the Conference League up until now, have not been as good organized offensively. Right. And therefore, he, you know, a Fiorentina game is ridiculous because the problem is they can't score, they create more chances than should be allowed. But somehow right. they cannot kill off games. Nico Gonzalez has been their go-to guy, but they've struggled since Vlaovic left. They can't. They don't seem to have someone who can put the ball into the back of the net, and that's why they've lost so many times or, or dropped points in the Serie A many times. Because Serie A, if you don't kill off your opponents, they will come back to bite you and haunt right. you. Um, so, so I'd say, yeah. I mean, this, I, I, you know, he has only one gear. He will probably go after Olympiacos. I've seen Olympiacos hurt teams. No, you know on the counter, especially yes. against Aston Villa, where you rip them apart. Um, uh, El Cabi definitely, definitely ripped them apart on mm -hmm. the counter. So, you know, he has to be cautious. He can't push up too naively or this game is over at half time. If, uh, if Olympiacos are having one of those days where they, where they, where we, where we, that we've seen they can have, because again, Aston Villa team top four, top five side in the, in the Premier League got ripped apart across two legs by Olympiacos. So, they have to re respect Olympiacos because if you, you know, you, you don't, you know, there, there are no mugs by any stretch of the imagination. And also you've got Stefan Jovetic who, with history in Fiorentina as well. So, no, Fiorentina have respect for Olympiacos, no doubt. And they have to be cautious. And I hope, given where Italiano hopes to go next, you know, he wants a career. He wants a big career. You know, he looks at Roberto de Zerbi and he's like, well, I can do that, but better. But in order for him to do that, I think, kind of deserve to be and him kind of suffer from one thing and from the same disease and that is the disease that they do not they are way way too open but nothing forgives that as much as success in europe and if um he were to win a trophy then he would and, and if he were to do it by showing tactical maturity as they say in italy then he, then the biggest then he's laying the pathway to a career which could end up at a Juve, it could end up at a Milan, it could end up at an Inter, it could end up really high, highly, uh, high up the, the, the league table or the ladder. But he needs to show maturity that we've, we are yet to see in finals, that is. Now, kind of focusing on the context for Olympiacos' success, you already alluded to the long ball to El Cabi, which was absolutely devastating for Aston Villa in many ways. Uh, but our core, our biggest, I should say, I don't, not advantage, our core strength, our biggest strength since Mendilibar arrived has been our press. It's been our pressing scheme, whether it's the sequence of our pressing traps or just the fact that he doesn't care who we play against. It's balls to the wall. He'll raise the line very high, whether it's from the start or as things ebb and flow. Our pressing has been the biggest strength. Our press and our counter press, I should say. How has Fiorentina handled teams with very good presses and counter presses, in your opinion? Well, it depends. I mean, if they if they if they beat your press, they can really hurt you. Right. But if you beat their press, you're basically alone with three players. I mean, it's 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 it, that. Therefore, when when I hear you say that, I kind of feel that. Well, this could be a very, very exciting and goal fest, essentially, because if it's two teams that are playing balls to the wall and no one and, and basically not going to worry about the, the, the opponent and not going to be any kind of cautiousness at all, but just going to go balls to the wall, press and counter press and, and push high up with a ridiculous high line, I fear we could see quite a few goals um, tomorrow. Yeah, and honestly, that's part of what concerns me in a way is, uh, you know, we really, if you look at how we've performed in Europe, that's our only, really our, our biggest strength. 
if we get sucked in deep, we've had the long ball, whether it's to our wingers, guys like Daniel Podence, who's done very well for us. Uh, uh, El Kabi, of course, I don't have to bring up anything else. Five goals and two legs over, you know, the, that round against Aston Villa. But for me, if we don't get the press rolling, our buildup out of the back has not been good. And what are you going yeah. to say? Mandelibar has been here two months, two yeah. and a half months. What can he do to, to really change your, your philosophy and possession over the course of two months? Not much, but what worries me is we're right now more or less a one trick pony. If we can't get the press going, we've got nothing. And Fiorentina can do just about everything press their buildup is better. And yeah. I see better things that they can do offensively as well. Yeah. Their buildup is good. Their buildup is fine. Um, so, so I think it's uh, my worry is that sometimes their press is not cohesive enough and it's a little bit naive. And, and if you can beat their press, you're essentially alone with their goalkeeper. But, it, you know, it, it seems that Olympiacos, I mean, if that's how Olympiacos are going to play, well, I wonder if they don't cancel each other out or that we just have this kind of crazy game where we have players or we have we have quite a we have so a lot of goal scoring opportunities early on. Uh, and I think both coaches might want to tweak something because it is a one-off final. It's not a two-legged final. It's just it's a right. one-off final, so you don't have that result to play off against. Um, so yeah, no, it's 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 going to be interesting to see. I mean, obviously, like you said, if you're if 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 Olympiacos aren't good at playing the ball out and playing deep and playing out, they they have to play their game. Maybe then Italiana's way of handling that is going, okay, we're going to play our game, but we're not going to be naive about it. We're going to try to absorb the pressure and win the ball high up from them. And then hurt them that way. That could also be some way he's he's done it, but he's not been very good at it in the Serie A. But then again, he's up against teams like Inter, right. Milan, you know, Napoli. It's it's you know, it's it, he struggled a lot against them. Um, and but also the caliber is a lot higher. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, you could say that, but yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you you'd be lying if you didn't say that. But but I think this is it's a very interesting uh, game because you know because of the dynamic of where you know, Olympia Costa and also the fact that, which I wanted to ask you about, I mean, this is being played in Ike Athens home stadium. And there was even talk of moving this game because of the fact that Olympia Kos coming to Ike Athens stadium and winning a trophy is like, that's not allowed. So how did they resolve it in the end? Because there was lots of anger about this and there was talk of, you know, security risks and so on and whatnot. Well, so the, the, the thing about this final is what this is Ike's this year is Ike's hundred year anniversary. Oof. This is their new stadium. You know, Oof. they just this stadium just opened last year. Oh, yeah. Uh this see the you know, there's a lot of big things about the stadium and the museum they just opened about the history of, of Ike and things related to Ike and Greek football. So huge milestone for them only to invite <laughs> Olympia said, and we could lift the title there. There's we've had various issues with fan violence and fan yeah, things course. over the course of the season. We actually had a two month ban on fans in stadium. Mm. Um, uh, you know, plus yeah, I read that. Fan, I read that, yeah. and that's why I wanted to know how did they manage to kind of calm things down. There were probably too many. I'm going to be honest with you. There were probably too many sponsors and individuals that already had tickets and things on that side of thing. It was already at that at the point. At the point where we knew Olympiacos would be in the final, it was too late to de to do anything about mm -hmm. it. As much as as much as they as you know, people tried. We had heard about letters to to UEFA from the police and yeah, but that's UEFA, what I read. Yeah, UEFA was not about to you know what I mean. Just up this and ruin everything and have to deal with everybody who already had accommodations it was never happening. It was no. always going to be here, and there's yeah. still been drama, a lot of drama about it. Um, I don't know if you heard Fiorentina and Olympiacos, the owners, do not have suites. They, they were not offered suites. Well, I can't imagine what, what that Rocco Comiso <laughs> would, would, would not get along with someone, whatever do you mean. Um, look, it's, it's Mediterranean countries and it's yeah. Mediterranean football club presidents. And if you know anything about the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean football and Mediterranean football club presidents, whether it's Greece or Turkey or Italy or Spain or Portugal or the Balkans, um, you know that you're dealing with, shall we say, <laughs> crazy people. Um, so 
that aren't maybe that in charge of their emotions always, <laughs> to put it diplomatically. So, yeah, I, I have seen that Rocco has been, Sio Rocco has been very angry and or he's been feisty and and, and and I was kind of expecting nothing but that. <laughs> um, and I know that Olympiacos president was also just as feisty back yes. and I was expecting nothing but that. Um, I would have been very, very surprised if they had gotten on. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the Mediterranean, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> no, exactly. It's Greece um, and Italy. It's like, what, <laughs> what, what do you want me to tell you? Like <laughs> the dysfunction and the craziness and the madness is just so similar that if you're Greek, you get it. If you're Italian, you get it. Like yeah. there's no, I don't need to introduce you to anything. You yeah, know, exactly. what like. <laughs> we all know where we are, so to speak. <laughs> yep. You go a little further west and like, wait, what's going on here? Like, guys, it's just a Tuesday. Relax. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, Nima, I want to talk about, um, uh, we're going on about 25 minutes here now. And as we start to approach the end of the segment, I kind of want to talk about specific strengths and weaknesses of Fiorentina. You alluded to some things already with how Fiorentina as far as both strengths and weaknesses, um, weaknesses regarding how high the line gets and how naive the press can be, uh, strengths in terms of, of various uh, uh, players, possession. So I wanted to kind of just ask you what you think will be really the three keys to victory for Fiorentina in this match tomorrow. I think the defense has to hold up. Um, the central defense especially, because they do play a man-man style marking uh, central all over the pitch. Um, they have to get their press right and they have to get their marking right. Um, Nico Gonzalez has to have a good game. Um, Belotti, Belotti will be a pain in the butt because Belotti never stops working, the number nine. Um, he is a workhorse. Um, never stops running, never stops battling for the ball. Um and, and, of course, they've got some really exciting midfielders, Mandragora, whom I absolutely love. Um, so, you know, they, they do have, they, they do, they've got players who, who, can, who can create and, and who can hurt you. But you need to watch out aerially uh, on set pieces, especially from Nico Gonzalez, because he's incredibly strong in the air. And, and we talked to uh, uh, Fiorentina uh, podcast about him. I, I the the remarkable thing about him, he's very good in the air, but he's also like very agile, very quick. And the one thing I we laughed about was that he he cuts inside, so he plays a lot on the right. He's left footed. I see him cut inside a lot, but I swear to God, I didn't see a goal come from these dangerous cuts inside and shots. Those I never saw a goal like that, even though he seems so dangerous doing mm. that all the time. Um, goal things from the air, follow through. Yeah, uh, plenty of I saw lots of follow through in the box by Fiorentina, like four or five players in the box on uh, following up with uh, in open play when balls or crosses are coming in, whether it's from the left back side. B uh, uh, Birogi, is that his name? Cristiano Biragi, Cristiano Biragi, Biragi. Set pieces you have to yeah. watch out for. Crazy. Cristiano Biragi is his, he has a left foot for free kicks and corners that is outstanding. Yeah. But he cannot defend to save his life. He's very weak, <laughs> right. he's clumsy, and he can give away penalties and stupid red cards and so on and so forth. So he needs to, you know, he 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 is a weakness defensively. But set pieces, he is an absolute strength for Fiorentina. So he, he he's one of their weaknesses. That was going to be my next thing. What do you yeah. think the three weaknesses or vulnerabilities? We defensively, talked about the line. Yeah, defensively they have weaknesses, and I think Biragi particularly uh, is is a weakness in defense. Uh, Interesting. Sure. So our left side's a very weak side because our full, left fullbacks are not great defensively, and their left side. So this could be a very interesting. I think game. there's goals in this game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, <you need> both. <laughs> I think it's going to be a goal fest. I, I think defending optional tomorrow. I, I think it's going to be <laughs> it's just going to be one of those games where they um, they go at it and I don't know how it ends. This could end five five, four three. Like it, it, it can go anywhere. Well, let's do it. Give me your match prediction for tomorrow. We're coming up to the end of this. Uh, what do you see as a scoreline for tomorrow? I think this could end three three after ninety minutes and go to extra time. Um, and someone wins 4-3 or something like that, honestly. Um, I think Fiorentina, because of the fact that they've lost three finals, 
Um, unfortunately, I think for 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 Greek football, who I know this is the first European Cup final since 1971, Panathinaikos, Panathinaikos, of course, your worst mm-hmm. enemies um, were the ones to last be in a final. And I remember when they were in a semi-final in the Champions League against Ajax that year when the Ajax won it, Vartsisha scored that goal against, uh, but then they got hammered by Ajax. Uh, so, so I know this is a long-awaited triumph for Greek club football to reach a final of the European Cup. Um, I just feel, and, and I know you've got some quality players and match winners in El Kabi and, and of course Stevan Jovetic, who, who is unbelievable when he's on his day. Um, but I do think that I think Fiorentina's routine of having been in finals is is going to to decide it here. And of course, Andrea Bellotti, who won the Euros with Italy, leading the line. Um, I think it's going to be tight. I think it's going to be lots of goals. But I think in the end, um, Fiorentina will just pull out after extra time. So I'm going to stick with my uh, my initial. And it, it's funny because like the way you explain the context, I could see that happening 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, I was kind of on the other the other side of the fence because I could I could see this just being like a grungy. The press is like nobody can keep possession well, yeah. just possession <laughs> back and forth. So yeah. I was like, look, one one penalties, and actually hearing from um, having a look and and hearing from people about Fiorentina's goalkeeper and seeing kind of how he's done with penalties. I wouldn't mind us getting the penalties because he doesn't look like he does too well with them. But our Costas mm. Torlakis has been. This like just has been phenomenal for us with penalties. So I'll take that. If one one penalties, I'll take it. And I'm taking the Libyakos if that happens. I mean, I, I think I think it does go to extra time. I think tomorrow does go to extra time. I think it's gonna be very I think it's gonna be very dramatic. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that the the simple routine of reaching so many pie finals and having players who have won uh, you know, played finals and dramatic finals, I, I think that might just edge out a little bit but other than that i don't think there's much between these two sides in a one-off game but also i mean the game is being played in athens and so you know i how many will there be more olympiakos fans as a result of that or have they regulated this really hard because of its being being in ike athens stadium that remains to be seen, to be honest with you. I know that there's been discussion about the ticket allocations and who's getting what. There was also um, a lot of heavy discourse over the fact that supposedly Ike and Panathinaikos fans were trying to get Fiorentina tickets so that they could be in the game rooting <laughs> against us. It's, of course they did. Of yeah. course they did. <laughs> we, and this was confirmed by, I spoke to Tito from the, the Viola Nation podcast, and he said that he was getting messages from Ike and Panathinaikos fans in droves <laughs> asking for tickets. He's like, you're not getting any, guys. Like, <laughs> it's not happening. Oh, my days. So. That's why we were thinking, we were talking about this on our podcast when previewing. He's like, well, well when, when we were saying, well, it's in Athens, yes, but it's not in friendly territory. So I wonder oh, no. who who's getting, the, you know, I wonder if this actually might work against Olympia because just the fact that it's in Athens is not, well, it'll help them. They won't be tired because they won't be traveling. But the atmosphere around the stadium, given which stadium it is, yeah. <laughs> there will be enough fans there at least. Of course. It'll be loud. It'll be loud. Oh. How many, you know, how many will actually be there is one thing, but I, I think there will be enough of an atmosphere. I would have loved to have this game at like 80,000, you know, because of the fact that it's it's two big fan bases. And it's only like, what, 22,500 seats? I thought it was 30. The new stadium should be 37,000. Yeah, something like that. But like, it's not a big stadium. I mean, I think, I know it's the Conference League and whatnot, but, and and of course they decided a year in beforehand, but it would have been nice to like seen it in a bigger stadium, 60, 70. I I think it would have been crazy because these are two very, very loud fan bases. Yeah. very passionate fan bases and it would have been so cool to see them go up against each other in a big ass stadium with proper choreographies and tifos i agree with you if if our football federation had its stuff together maybe <laughs> at the olympic stadium which seats you know over fifty thousand. but um unfortunately that was never going to happen i mean you probably have two stadiums really um, that are kind of up to par for this type of thing. You have Libyakos's, the Yoros Karaskaki, which hosted the Super Cup. Yeah. The Super Cup in the summer. And then now the new Hagia Sophia Ike Stadium. 
um, uh, Opa Arena, which it's now it's the corporate name for it, I guess. But I mean, there's there's probably no other stadium that they would ever consider hosting this out. Leo Foros, which is Panathinaikos Stadium, is kind of you know it's yeah is it it's old? old it's yeah. old and kind of you know kind of gross so they're they are looking to get a new stadium so and then yeah. you have in thessaloniki there's tumba which is box stadium which is also like that's yeah you're not hosting anything big there so <laughs> uh that's these, how it the, is. The, the the medit the, the mediterranean countries and the never-ending debate of new stadiums <laughs> and old stadiums i am so bloody fed up with this that i don't uh, italy italian inter and milan i mean i love the san Siro. i was there last week as uh, accredited to what as, as a part of the press covering inter lazio and the you know scudetto party and it's an amazing stadium but it's bloody old and yeah. it, you know they They've actually got nets around the stadium to prevent slabs of concrete falling off. Like it's, oh I mean, my it's, god! Yeah, it's like it's a level of dysfunction that is like, <laughs> guys, you know, like, <laughs> are you serious? Yeah, I mean, it's, oh, I did not know but that. They, but they have they they're monitoring the vibrations so that you know because when eighty thousand people jump. And 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 so they've, that's why the third tier, parts of the third tier of the San Siro is closed down, not because they're afraid that it's going to fall down, but because they look, you know, it, when everyone jumps, you can feel it, okay, and people can panic, and so they've created this like in the third tier in the middle, no one can be seated, so that if anything were to happen, they can quickly, you know, have people jump in there and not get trampled on. But it's 2024. Why are we talking about people getting trampled? Like. I mean, it's just I I'm so fed up with Mediterranean countries and the dysfunction when it comes to these <laughs> things, man. Like it doesn't matter if it's Turkey or Greece or Italy or like just oh do you know what I mean? Get, get us new stadiums. <laughs> just get us new stadiums. Just get it you. fucking built. I'm sorry, but I'm sorry for swearing, but I'm so fed up with it. Like, you know, and it's like Milan and Inter, two of the biggest clubs in Europe, can't get a bloody stadium built. I mean, you had this whole the whole situation where they had like this old the old guard that you know had this only the second tier of San Siro declared a building of special cultural significance. I mean, because essentially, if you do that, then you can't tear it down because if you tear it down, well, you can't tear down the first tier because then the second tier will fall off. So, you know, you problem solved. And now they're trying to get around that by getting a company who in Rome who has, is who, because obviously Rome is just one giant excavation site, isn't it? Because of the Roman Empire and they keep finding things. So they, they've got this company whose name eludes me now. Um, and, and they're basically saying, well, actually we can work around this and refurbish the San Siro, even though these people have, you know, legally made the second tier of San Siro essentially a hundred-year-old slab of concrete marinated in the centuries of piss. They've made it a building of special... I mean, it's just... I can't even... I just don't... I'm so fed up. Like, I'm just so fed up. It's gotten to the point where Italy can actually lose the Euros that they're going to host with Turkey unless they start get, getting a move on with stuff like this. You know, it's just... It's <laughs> It's funny hearing here. This is I feel like, wow, it, it, in ways, I feel like the the Italian FA is like similar to how, how we you think you said that it's just, it's, I'm telling you, it's, it's something in the water in the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> That's the problem. There's something in the water that makes everything dysfunctional in the Mediterranean. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's just On something that, no. in the water, man. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, we'll see what it, what else is in the water tomorrow. <laughs> Whatever's in the water, it'll benefit Fiorentina. Maybe it benefits <laughs> Libya. Who knows? Nima, thank you so much for joining us uh, here. It was a great talk. You gave us lots of great insights about not just uh, Fiorentina, but uh, Italian football as well and what we could expect going into tomorrow. Uh, really quick before we close up, where can our fans follow you? Uh, you're part of multiple projects. You are co-founder of two huge projects. Uh, please let the fans know where they can follow you. Well, thank you. Um, if they want to follow me on Twitter, the handle's there on the screen, at NimaTavRWD. And if they want to listen to the Italian Football Podcast, they you know they can follow us on all podcast platforms and YouTube, at ItaFootPod. Uh, we do a Monday pod where we review the weekend's uh, action, and and that's free for all on Spotify, Google Podcast, uh, 
Apple, iOS, whatever. And then, of course, if they want to become a patron for two ninety nine a month, and they can join and they get a you know they get the chance. We have a Q and A pod that we publish every Tuesday, and then we have a Thursday pod going through everything that happens midweek um, and preview the weekend. And of course, during the summer, we'll be working a lot on the Euros as well as focusing heavily as we always do on on the transfer window for every club so yeah well thank you for sharing that guys and his handle and uh, the shows will be uh in the description here well, you'll also see them on socials when we publish the the episode as well check him out he's got great content they have uh the hysterical stuff they do over there um i love also how you guys clown on uh british football too it, just, <laughs> it, warm, it warms my heart and uh, the prem anyway, faces, check it out. yeah, <laughs> yeah prem face yeah prem face. i love that, that's actually love... yeah that's carlo's invention that's his <laughs> yeah. child he came up with that with the, the, the prem face i think if you go on urban dictionary and type in prem face you actually see that carlo gargani has did <laughs> he contribute that and it's like 13 years ago or something he came up with that yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. So go go check out Nima Tavali, the work he does for not just for the Italian football podcast, which is very good, but also Sempre Inter. Um, uh, quality content over there. You can follow Nima on Instagram. You're on IG and yeah, yeah we're our, our, we're on everywhere. It's I Ita Foot. We're the same handle on all 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 platforms. Uh, Ita Ita Foot Pod at perfect. So yeah. Well, you guys know where to follow him. Thank you for tuning in. Big day coming up. We've given you all the pre-match that you could possibly get for this match. Now we just wait and see what happens tomorrow. This, I'm Adi. This is Gate 7 International by the fans for the fans. And we'll see you guys post-match.